Of all the Norse kings from the sagas, Harald Bluetooth is one of the strangest. When it comes to common understanding of the man, I'd say more people know him for what he didn't do than what he did do. His runic initials famously were the inspiration for today's Bluetooth technology symbol, but beyond that, I challenge you to think about what he's known for in actual history. In reality, his most impactful decision around Denmark probably was the introduction of Christianity to the region, or maybe his public works and bridges. He's one of those rare pre-Christian Scandinavian kings that was not known just for war. In CK3, you can, of course, pursue just about any path you'd like with your characters, and that means Harald here might have a destiny different from the sagas. Dropping in Yiland, Harald is a pretty okay character. Nothing too impressive, but certainly acceptable. He's a raider, and a Varangian of course, and to spice things up, he's Danish, not Norse, which means my cultural traditions are a little different than others around me. First off is, of course, a marriage, and the classic Norse pick, Saga the Truth Speaker, is available. She's a great choice on account of the alliance it makes with Jorvik and her genetics. Being more of a stewardship-oriented character than Marshall, Harald just wants to rule a prosperous realm with hunts, feasts, and tournaments galore. That can be tough without any money to pay for it, but thankfully there's an overseas bank known as England just a short voyage through the North Sea. Raiding is a means to an end for Harald. The first raiding campaign against Wessex was successful, with the Saxon troops being distracted by the great heathen army. During the campaign, Harald had his first child, a girl he named Sigrid. After a short stint into Wales, the armies returned home and Harald appointed his Hofgo the Einar as the master of the hunt. The riches of England would be translated into a hunt in yelling for a wolf. Because Harald's realm is quite small for now, these aren't any particularly interesting hunt participants, with just Einar, the master of the hunt, and two other courtiers, Karatan and Flossi, joining him. The goal of the hunt is to take down an animal big enough to get his name on the map, or perhaps more appropriately, on the runestones. After working things out with some poachers and adopting a new pet raptor, Karatan spotted the wolf. The chase was on, but the damn thing got away unfortunately. While not the great hunt he was hoping for, Harald demonstrated some skill and learned a bit about hunting. Obviously, the story of the yelling hunt would have to be spread around other realms, and the best way to do that is to host a feast. A feast is always a great place to share stories and get some hype around one's exploits. The special guest will be Harald's only vassal, Helena the Chronicler. The hope is to give her some ideas for what to write down in her chronicles, such that she might spread the word of the amazing yelling hunt. Maybe she'd even embellish a bit for his sake. The feast would be quite an occasion, with wild animals joining in on the party. Things calmed down eventually, and Harald had a nice conversation about investment opportunities with Asta. Apparently though, while the animal was ravaging the party, Harald made some promise to Helena. He denied it though, depriving her of a hook. The climax of the party culminated in the toast to Helena's writing abilities, and the great banquet was concluded. Such a great feast did indeed attract many Varangian warriors to Harald's court, which he can hopefully use to raid for more money. With the time of feasting and celebrating over, another raiding party was raised in East Yelland. Hopefully the Bank of England has restocked their reserves. Just before heading off on a raid, young Sigrid asked her father what it is exactly he does when he goes off in the boats and comes back later. Not wanting to upset his daughter, he told her that he goes off to a magical land in the west where adults go to find food for feasts. She was pleased, but maybe a little sheltered. Anyway, the magical land of Kent had indeed restocked its supplies and all that magical gold found its way into Harald's hands, and he returned home, welcomed by his family. Harald really was living the life to be honest, and that's mostly on account of his lack of ambition. He was happy ruling Yeland and Sledgevig while his more ambitious neighbor Sigurd Snake in the Eye was off paving the path to becoming King of Denmark. Nonetheless, the party must go on. Harald put together the ornaments and trinkets from the abbeys of England and put together a grand tournament for dueling to be hosted in Riba. Now this will be a party, hopefully. He's going all out with this one. The best prizes and the best accommodations only will do. The hunter who spotted the wolf before, Kjartan, will be his champion, but Harald will probably just compete himself alongside his champion. Rather unexpectedly, this tournament actually attracted a pretty wide audience, with petty kings from England and Scandinavia sailing into Riba. Even foreigners from Poland and the Christian world were showing up. After a couple months, all the guests arrived and the duels began. The first round was between Kjartan himself and Harald. Being the just man he is, Harald chose to have a legitimate duel against his champion. He even put a bet on himself, in good spirit. After just two rounds of fighting, Harald came out on top, striking down his own champion. After that fight, the next round was quite simple, as Hemming simply conceded. Meanwhile, the master of the hunt, Einar, was dueling an earl from England, Waltheof. He did, unfortunately, lose. Seems the master of the hunt can neither defeat a wolf nor an Englishman. He might need to be replaced at this point. The final duel will be between the earl and Harald himself. It was a bit anticlimactic though, as after only one round, Harald won the duel, and thus the entire competition. It's always a little bit suspicious when the winner of a competition is the host, but don't worry, there was surely no cheating here. For winning, Harald got a little bit of gold back on his investment in the tournament and won a beautiful mace. Man, that's actually a really nice mace. Time to go back home and admire the new mace.
His victory attracted yet more warriors from across Scandinavia, and even though he didn't plan to use them much, more men meant more safety and more money. Speaking of money, it's raiding time. The Bank of England's looking a little barren right now, but thankfully another bank just opened up shop down in Paris. With the new troops Harald's gatherings have attracted, the bank should recognize them and allow a clean withdrawal of funds. While completing his transaction in Normandy though, Sigurd of Sialand took the opportunity to invade. A little dishonorable, I'd say, attacking a man while he's banking, but the fleets got into the Seine and sailed back home. Calling on his father-in-law and Jorvik, the numbers are about even, but being so out of position will make this war hard. The Sigurds only wanted Vorbasa from Harald, which was actually the county ruled by Helena the Chronicler. Of all counties to take, this would be the least painful to lose, and so after one battle went awry, Harald surrendered. The only downside of this is that the elderly chronicler likely won't be able to finish her work without a county to call home. Her family and name will ultimately fade into obscurity. I'm sorry Helena, but your sacrifice will not go in vain. This conquest created quite some animosity between the Bluetooth and Sigurd families. Immediately a plot to kill the snake-eyed Sigurd began. It was a pipe dream to get him killed, but anything is possible when a Dane is driven by vengeance. A raid against the rival Danes successfully burned down Copenhagen, although no family of any meaning was captured. Although still tentatively a relatively passive Jarl, Harald is feeling a little angry about his loss at war. Who wants to party with a loser? After a failed attempt on Sigurd's life, hostilities only got worse. With all the alliances Sigurd's got though, fighting him will be almost impossible. To assemble a larger army, Harald is going to keep attending hunts and tournaments whenever he can. A couple more failed hunts later, and a tournament off in Norway, Harald's first son, Valdemar, was born, with another pregnancy soon after. The next child was Ingigerd, whose birth was celebrated with the first successful Yelander hunt of 884. It was successful, but the wolf unfortunately managed to take a chunk out of Harald in the form of his entire left arm. The now maimed petty king may have gained fame from the kill, but at what cost? More fame is needed though. Harald is desperate to attract more warriors, and for that purpose he sailed south to Constantinople. Burning down the city of Roald's desire must be a way to earn a place in the sagas, right? Especially to do it one-handed. The Byzantines arrived to stop the raid, and although they lost the battle, they killed enough Northmen to make the raid untenable. Although Constantinople will not burn today, the Byzantine armies were at least defeated. On the way back home, in an effort to keep himself alive a bit longer, Harald adopted a healthier lifestyle. Sadly for him, it was too late, as within about a year of coming back home from Greece, Harald passed away at the age of 42, leaving the throne to his 7-year-old son, Valdemar. When Harald died and his son took the throne, it was his only adult daughter, Sigrid, who took over as regent. Sigrid is only 20 herself and was relatively sheltered from political life. She's not exactly a competent ruler herself, although she's strong and well-read. She's loyal to her younger brother and hopefully will lead the realm in a good direction. While Yiland grieves the death of their Jarl, the Sigrid family have proclaimed themselves the kings of Denmark. Harald would have been quite upset to hear this news, but it's only saving grace that he didn't get to hear the news on account of his death. The Trojan of Harald will work jointly to keep the realm together in his name, and for that, the sagas named these years the Era of Child Monarchs. While the new Jarl Valdemar stayed back home, meeting his peers and learning what he could from his mother and other courtiers, Sigrid sent off the armies to go west, as her father taught her all that time ago. What she didn't realize was that the magical land west of the sea did in fact not magically generate the food needed for feasts, but instead was about pillaging and destroying foreigners. How such a sheltered woman became regent is an interesting question, but she took the news well. Sigurd was ready to grow up. She ordered the next raid off to Copenhagen, knowing her father would have liked to stick it to Sigurd one last time. Critically though, Sigurd wasn't expecting a raid out of a Jarl who was less than 10 years old. When the armies surrounded Copenhagen, Sigurd couldn't escape and he was captured. To tie off the family rivalry and end the animosity, Sigrid ordered the king's execution, which unfortunately Valdemar had to watch. It was a little traumatizing, but he'll live. With the Danish king dead, his alliances are annulled, and by right of conquest, Sigrid demanded the throne. Obviously, Sigrid's heir, Knud, simply said no, and war broke out. Valdemar wasn't sure what exactly was going on, but he was just happy that he was able to spend time with his friends even while at war. Sadly, Valdemar's mother, Saga, was pretty harsh on him. She was grieving her husband's death and wanted a worthy successor for him. Valdemar suffered his first stress break in 894 while his sister was off fighting in Copenhagen. Fortunately, Sigrid did return shortly after, declaring that Jarl Valdemar was no longer a Jarl, but a king. What exactly that means for him is uncertain, but Valdemar is starting to understand how rulership works thanks to his sister. Nonetheless, the king of Denmark will remain subject to one woman, his mother. During the playdates, which Valdemar normally looked forward to, his mother was always looming in the background, watching. She was observing if he would make the right choices, and when Gida, the daughter of the subjugated Knud, was in danger, Valdemar wanted to ignore her. She's the daughter of a rival anyway, but Saga stared at him. He had to demonstrate his bravery to the vassals and save the poor girl from some peasant who thought higher of himself. All this pressure is mounting, as Valdemar had another stress break. During the very same playdate, his younger sister Ingigerd climbed a tree and invited the cowardly Valdemar to join. 
He already knew he had no choice, but upon reaching the top, his mother's glare was too much. The poor Valdemar fell from the tree after a nervous breakdown, but it wasn't the fall that killed him. He had died from a heart attack before even hitting the ground. Poor kid. I can only imagine how Saga felt, although perhaps she wasn't aware that it was her unending pressure that put the boy in danger. Either way, the throne now passed to his older sister and regent, Sigrid. She was a natural fit given her clear aptitude for rulership on account of her regency, and that by now she's 26, which is plenty old enough to actually run the kingdom. The new queen, Sigrid, took the throne, grieving her poor, innocent brother, but happy to at least have her younger sister, Ingigerd. One personality trait Sigrid had developed over the course of her rulership was a combination of bullheaded stubbornness and extremely high standards for men. At 26, she is still unmarried, which in the 9th century is quite scandalous. She wasn't a lesbian or anything sinful like that, just a woman who knows what she wants. She's going to have a grand wedding with some chivalrous prince, or she won't marry at all. While looking for viable options, she was harangued by her mother to at least find a politically viable husband if she can't make up her mind. In frustration, she threw up her arms and offered a betrothal to the king of Sweden to get engaged to his 10-year-old son. A 26-year-old woman being betrothed to a 10-year-old prince somehow ended up being more scandalous than her being unmarried, but the alliance was secured and perhaps even future claims to Sweden if the marriage can be fruitful. These scandals resulted in pretty much universal dislike for Sigrid across all vasts of Denmark, although being a female monarch, she had trouble enough to begin with. In an attempt to improve her perception amongst the lords, she hosted a tournament in Riba for archery, paying all the money she'd gotten from the raids she did during Valdemar's reign. She didn't qualify for her own archery competition, which is a little embarrassing, but the event did turn out well, with a Dane Earl from the Dane Law winning the competition. Next up, she hosted a hunt in the new famous Yelling Forest, where her father had lost his arm to a wolf. She was going to take the opportunity to try and make friends with her vassal in Skane. Unfortunately, basically no one attended the hunt, making it yet another embarrassing gathering for Sigrid. One development that was definitely a plus for her though, was that the King of Sweden died, and somehow the lords there elected her betrothed Kettle, meaning she's now betrothed matrilineally to the King of Sweden. As well, she declared her knight, Botolf, to be the Eagle of Arus, which was an accolade I was thinking about renaming, but to be honest, I kind of like the name it generated, so I'm keeping it. He would get the chance to prove his mettle in a liberty war that Sweden called Denmark into. Although a simple liberty war isn't really anything to worry about, Sigrid wanted to prove some of her martial ability, so she put significant resources towards the war. After a battle in northern Sweden, Sigrid began a siege in Jamtaland, but as fate sometimes turns out, one of the siege engines malfunctioned disastrously and sent shrapnel right into Sigrid's head, killing her instantly. A true shame that Sigurd would never get to see her grand wedding, nor find love for herself. Instead, she would die to what should have just been routine. The throne was left to Ingigerd, the last of Harald's children. She's the final child monarch of Harald, and if she should pass away, there are no heirs left to take over. The realm won't breathe a sigh of relief until Queen Ingigerd has an heir. Ingigerd, as the youngest sibling, never liked all the hostilities with the realm's vassals. Perhaps not an illustrious marriage, but a comfortable one, she decided to get betrothed to the youngest of the Sigurd heirs, Svein. Although the Sjallander Jarl certainly doesn't like the royal family much, this is an opportunity he really can't pass up, so he accepted, and in 13 years the marriage will come through. This was a little scary to have to wait 13 years for even a chance at an heir, but Ingigerd had a plan. She was going to, in an extremely controversial move, take on a lover and have children out of wedlock as heirs, while her marriage to Svein would be political. If her mother were still alive, she would likely have thrown this idea out, along with the scandalous champion Hogni that Ingrid was using. Funnily enough, it was Saga's overwhelming pressure as a mother that resulted in Valdemar's death, and had she still been around to pressure the last of the child monarch, she might have ended the dynasty, as thanks to Ingigerd's unorthodox air production method, she became pregnant and could produce an heir. While attending a tournament in Latvia, Ingigerd felt her pregnancy, and to assure her vassals that the realm was secure, she went on a grand taxation tour. She would need money for all the little things her baby will need, so the vassals have to pay up. She didn't want too long of a trip, so rather than visit every single vassal, she'd pass through the majority of her realm and stop in Skane to see Jarl Ursa. Unfortunately, Jarl Ursa became busy and let Ingrid know that she would not be able to host a feast, and the tour immediately ended. Yeah, I was planning to actually make use of that tour RP-wise, but oh well, just pretend it happened. Ingrid gave birth right after the tour to a son named Rorik. He's a bastard, of course, but he will be legitimized, finally producing an heir for the realm. This era marks the end of the era of child monarchs, with Hogni never being mentioned by name on any runestones due to the scandal. It was only mentioned that Ingigerd simply became pregnant, leaving people to either assume a four-year-old did it, her betrothed, which was quite unsavory, or that perhaps Rorik was the son of one of the gods. A lot of weight rests on the poor boy's shoulders. There's a lot of comfort to having an heir at all, although until the poor kid grows up, that security can feel a bit vapid. For now, Ingigerd's reputation is a bit sullied by her lover scandal, but she can supplant that reputation by replacing it with other accomplishments. As so many other Norse people begin their goals, she started by raiding England. She gave birth to yet another bastard while raiding in Dorset, who she named Rune. He too would be legitimized. Ingigerd finished her raid in England, returned home and reorganized for another raid in France. 
she was slowly earning herself some respect in the Scandinavian world with her accomplishments. Something rather fortuitous happened when she returned from France, and that was a genuine retaliation from the Christian world. The Lotharingians declared war to take a piece of the Yeland Peninsula. While war is usually scary, especially from a Carolingian, instead this was an opportunity to unite the realm behind defending against a foreigner. If anything, they were doing a favor to the Danish queen by trying to attack her, given that they had no chance to win against her elite heavy infantry. As an assurance of her victory, Ingegerd arranged a betrothal between her second son, Rune, and the princess of Jorvik, Asta. Jorvik is also ruled by a petty queen, who was looking to secure her realm's legitimacy a bit too, and this diplomatic connection resulted in a pretty close connection between Jarl Kraka and Ingegerd, who were already cousins by blood. Don't mind the inbreeding, dear viewer. There was one threat to the throne though, which came up in the form of a threatening letter from Knud of Sialand. He knew of Ingegerd's secret. She was a cannibal in her off time. This obviously salacious rumor would, for now, be accepted as blackmail, since although the queen would never eat a person, she feared that the lie could go on to harm her. Regardless, the first Christian armies landed in Reba, and they were easily wiped out. Knud's blackmail should end up being pointless, since he's already relatively old, and he will pass away in due time. Nominally, the Sigurd family is now allied to the Bluetooth since their betrothal. It's a bit dishonorable to blackmail your new family allies, but at the same time, maybe it could be pinned on Knud the Insane's own personal, well, insanity. There's no reason to condemn the entire family over it for now. More Christian armies are arriving in Schleswig, but it seems like they are just little scout armies and that Lotharingia is busy dealing with the other wars. Why they declared this war in the first place is a question for history, but it might have been that the Carling King believed his realm to be more stable than he thought. During the war, Ingegerd commissioned a crown from a traveling pole whose name was not inscribed on the runestones due to it being just a little hard to transcribe into runes. Instead, he was called the Wendish Crown Master. The crown he created became a symbol of royal security and marked a stark shift in Danish politics away from tribal life. Although still very much so tribal, Denmark will be heading in a more feudalized direction with this crown as a leading symbol for that transition. While attending some boring wedding off in Burgundy, Ingegerd received news that her blackmailing father-in-law-to-be, Knud, finally passed away meaning her cannibalistic secret would be safe for now. The new Jarl, Hrani, seemed relatively friendly to Danish interests. This emboldened the queen who took the fight back to the Lotharingians on account of their inability to send even a modicum of an army. In 917, the war finally ended with the Carling King paying some war operations and Ingegerd using that money to fund a glorious wedding with the Sigurd Prince. She's going to plot the murder of the new Sjallander Jarl though in the hopes she can consolidate the Sigurd holdings into the hands of her fiancé, Sven. Whether this will work out or not will be interesting to see. The wedding left some worry in Ingegerd's mind about becoming some obedient queen to an undeserving king, but ultimately that worry isn't anything to consider, since all that power lies in her own hands as the real queen. One great comfort during the wedding was Jarl Kraka from Jorvik, who assured Ingegerd that married life isn't as scary as it looks, even for free spirits like themselves. Kraka was previously married, but her husband had mysteriously died. It was heavily implied that Kraka took care of him. The two became friends over mutual interests in maintaining their status as free women. While plotting out the murder of Frani at the wedding, Ingegerd lost heart in the plot due to just how enjoyable he was to have around the party. Frani was turning into a good friend, even though he's the son of a horrible man. It's a little scandalous for her husband, Svein, who preferred that his brother not spend so much time with the bride, but friendship waits for no one. The two went from a potential murder plot to best friends suddenly. During the consummation of the marriage, Sven and Ingegerd went on a long walk where they discussed their future married life. They both knew their marriage was a union between two families that hate each other, but maybe their issues can be resolved in due time. For a family spawned by a man with the moniker of Insane, these Sigurds are pretty reasonable. This was looking like a beautiful unification of houses. That is, until Sven died eating some poisonous plants in the Yeland Peninsula. The idiot ate some nightshade from the garden before heading home. That nightshade was meant for Hrani until the plan changed, but now it appears that Ingegerd assassinated poor Sven despite her having nothing to do with his death. Of course, her best friend, Hrani, completely understood, blaming his brother for his stupidity. Throwing her hands in the air, Ingegerd is tired of these political marriages. She chose to just marry her lover, Hogni. No more political marriages, no more friendships with lords, and no more politicking. If the Sigurd family can't even get married right, why should they still be around? As part of the move towards a more feudal society, Ingegerd invoked her rights as liege to seize a vassal from Hrani. This was just the beginning of her new hostility towards what could have been her closest Danish allies. While revoking land from the vassal she took in Vorbasa, Ingegerd gave birth to her first legitimate child, Niels. For now, she'll be leaving the Sigurds alone, because a more important issue has popped up in Sweden. There's a child king stuck in a civil war, and the Swedish Jarls have requested that a strong ruler step in to help restore peace to Sweden. Ingegerd is happy to answer that call. Shortly after declaring her war to subjugate Sweden, the child king was replaced with Sif af Munso, who will do her best to put up a fight against what is a pretty dire war. I find it interesting that there have genuinely been so many female rulers of note, by the way. 
This is not scripted or anything, it just happened to end up this way, which is always interesting to see. Speaking of interesting female characters, the unmarried giantess of the Sigurd spawn was getting too annoying to put up with anymore. The only way to free herself of this family is to eradicate the last member before she can breed, and with that, Ingrid began a murder plot against Saga, the last of Canute's children. It had turned out that Hrani died of some illness while the queen was attending a wedding in Poland, which was quite fortunate, given that murder can be difficult and morally scrupulous. It was already rumored that she had killed her husband Sven, which truly was a false rumor, and the sudden death of Hrani put even more suspicion on her. Nonetheless, might as well finish the job, Ingigerd thought. During the war, the Danelaw king, Ragnar, offered a betrothal between his daughter Ursa and Rorik, Ingigerd's firstborn son. While wary of the strange Anglo-Nordic king, she was assured by her friend Kraka that he could be trusted and the betrothal was set up. Shortly after, Ragnar passed away and then the plot to kill Saga succeeded, although Ingigerd's involvement was exposed. This certainly worried the young Jarl of Sjallan, Tosti, whose sister was already on the chopping block as far as Ingigerd was concerned. Meanwhile, the war in Sweden was finally brought to an end as the Queen of Sweden, Sif, was dragged out of her hall to be dethroned. The Swedish lords welcomed their new Danish queen, and Sweden's time of instability is finally over. Ulfhild was killed without any hassle, and now there's just one last Sigurd to take care of, and his heir is one of the Danish queen's children. Perfect. The Sigurd family can be supplanted by the Bluetooths, with history favoring the superior family. Niels will become the new lord of Sigurd's domain. Unfortunately, the savvy young Jarl was aware that his life was in danger and managed to evade the assassins. These people don't know when to quit. Instead, Ingrid went on a tour of the realm to secure her control over Sweden and to put some of her more insolent vassals in their places. While visiting the murder evading Tosti, he had the gall to embarrass the queen at the feast he arranged for her, and that was the last straw. When Tosti also refused to pay his tribute, he was declared outlaw, and once Ingrid was done her tour of the realm, she would dispense justice against the insolent lord. Thankfully, the Swedish hosts of the realm have been quite welcoming, and a great friendship between Swedes and Danes is being established with great food and good drink. Either way, the tour is over now, and now Tosti will pay. The Sigurd family will finally be wiped out. As expected, Tosti did not accept imprisonment and a war ensued. Why the boy thought he could win must have been on account of his lack of wise judgement. He is only 15, after all. By the time the war was over, he had turned 16, and maybe now he understands better not to insult the superiors. By now, though, that lesson is too late, as for his refusal to pay taxes, both he and his realm would be consumed by Ingigerd. Niels is the new Jarl of Sjaland, and the Sigurds are finally no more. With the last Sigurd dead, Denmark is united under one house from top to bottom. Ingrid has cleared the way for her family to rule Denmark for themselves. There are no more rival houses, nor pretenders to worry about, and with that, the queen is poised to only expand her influence. The Swedish nobles are loyal and happy to serve. Her Danish subjects have prospered under her rule, and the memories of her scandalous bastards have been forgotten, with Hogni being accepted as king and the bastards' legitimacy entirely out of the question. To celebrate the defeat of her enemies, a tournament in Riba began, and the questions about where to go next racked the queen's mind. Perhaps England, she thought? Her friend and ally, Kraka of Jorvik, could be a great source of knowledge about the island, and through her marriage connections to her, she could lay genuine claim to at least one region. The same goes for the Danelaw, whose king passed away relatively early into his rulership. In the end, it was back to the regularly scheduled raids against the usual suspects, while the realm resumed some sense of normalcy. Seeking guidance, Ingigerd went on a pilgrimage to Jorvik. It was a good excuse to see her friend, as well as make a pious trip for her own sake. She had the opportunity to forsake her cannibalism when she realized that, well, eating people is probably not a way into Valhalla. She did take the opportunity, knowing that her last human meal would be Tosti, who probably deserved it. With that, she went back home with renewed courage. For now, that's the end of the first part of House Bluetooth's story. While off on a falcon hunting trip, Ingrid felt strange staying on her laurels. She has further dreams when she's getting older, and maybe she should focus on her succession and her children. Time will tell. But for now, I hope you enjoyed the video. War of the Bluetooth family is yet to come. Thank you for your time.